I'm waking this guy up very early in the morning, although he tells me he's been up for a long time already. He's on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast of the U.S. He's Paul Gorman. Paul, welcome to our show, man. I've been looking forward to talking <laughs> to you. How are you? Oh, really well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your offer to come on on the show. I've watched several episodes, and of course, I, I've known uh, your your little brother, you yeah. know, out yeah. there playing some great golf, and and you both doing great jobs on the uh, commentary throughout the throughout the world. Really, thanks, man. I appreciate you. That's very kind. But I want to make this about you. Uh, okay, right. uh, for anyone who's um, followed you on social media, who's taken lessons with you, they know. You're one of the best. In fact, you were the ranked the best instructor in California. Uh, but that's a quick aside. Uh, for the rest of our audience from around the globe, from wherever they're listening and watching, it is available on YouTube on my website, this uh, podcast. Um, tell us a little bit about Paul, uh, how you came to where you are, former player, all that sort of stuff. Please give us the synopsis. Well, yeah, it. Uh, I was a little late arrival into the. Uh golf world in my 30s uh, when I decided to become a golf professional yeah. and um, ended up the first two years uh, I was a professional Hank Haney did a golf school at where I work mm -hmm. and and that was right after I think Omira had won back-to-back -back masters or won the masters uh, a couple times anyway Hank's presentation uh, blew me away because I got on the golf business to become a uh, a player yeah, right. and that didn't that didn't pan out <laughs> But uh, when I watched Hank do his presentation, it was amazing. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to teach the game of golf. And so I went to work renting uh, Ledbetter's tapes with uh, Faldo and, and uh, Nick Price and started <laughs> testing and copying and, yeah, yeah going down to uh, uh, silver screen video and renting and, you know, making notes and all that stuff. And eventually um, I got connected uh, through my own work with uh, – a couple of the greats, Jim Hardy, and I helped pioneer the one plane golf swing. Mm -hmm. I got involved. Uh, one of my students was a, a neurologist at my club, and uh, he uh, was introduced to Mac O'Grady. Mac O'Grady loves doctors. He got me in the golf school. I went down to see him in the golf school. There were some similarities with what Jim was doing, but uh, Mac stuff was just incredible. And so um, I was introduced to them, mm -hmm. uh, to him, and then at that school, Mike and Andy were there for Stack and Tilt, and I helped uh, launch kind of Stack and Tilt as well uh, at that time and had golf schools at my uh, at my club yeah. and really just started following my passion uh, for teaching the game of golf and uncovering everything I could. Yeah, you sort of been at the gen genesis of all of these, uh, a lot of these great movements. And, and it's uncanny to me how you've spurned so many great instructors. And because of that, just kind of your manner, how you've been around so many great instructors too. And they've kind of formed, well, I certainly have, you mentioned Led, who was a mentor of mine, still is a mentor of mine, and John Jacobs, like way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Influence, uh, how they all have this influence on us. And, and so I, I want you to, you mentioned Jim Hardy. I know folks have a lot of questions about one plane. Quickly mm -hmm. describe that for the folks who misunderstand. Oh, yeah. what, what is the one plane move? And then we'll get into some of the stuff that you learned, I learned and uh, now have um, kind of built on with your time with Mac O'Grady. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess one other thing too, uh, a guy named Kelvin Miyahira that I know you know of, that uh, a lot of people do not know, unfortunately. Well, fortunate for me, I, I went out to Hawaii to meet him and got to spend some time with him. And he pioneered kind of the biomechanics uh, early on about how the body moves yeah. and the joints. And that was the first experience I got into that. And um, the drive hold wrist condition, which means that your, your wrist hold the position through the hitting zone, which is a very stable club face instead of a rolling uh, pattern, which <laughs> you, 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 you are gripping people's attention right now. They're like, Oh, I want to hear more about that, but let me pull you back before we get to that stuff. So okay. quick, so, so quickly, just gloss over the one plane thing because yeah. a lot of folks, I feel like have a real misunderstanding of this. Sure. And my goal with this podcast always is because we're so quick to poo poo something if we don't understand it. So that's why I just want you, because I feel like this could be helpful to so many of the folks who are watching and listening to this. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do it. I'm just going to turn a little bit to the side here. 
All right. And as I bend to the ground, I'm sitting right now, but the one plane swing with any when the left arm matches the shoulder plane, All right. which means the points of when the shoulders make a line, your left arm would be parallel to. Yeah. So that would be viewed sometime as a low plane, you know, kind of a lower across the body plane, the left arm across the, the pecs, in my case, as a righty. Mm -hmm. And then the two plane swing would be one more in which the arms lift a little bit more separate of the shoulders, uh -huh. turning. Shoulder turn one plane, two plane, arms up above. So it's shoulders on one line and then the arms separating and, and uh, moving upward. Mm. As we know, both in the Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're looking at current golfers, a nice example of a two planer would probably be Justin Thomas. Um, correct. You agree with that? And I'm uh, well. Cooch was, you know, we've had Chris O'Connell over, over here, so Matt Coocher is 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 a real one planer. Yeah, looking at and that. John Rahm is not too far behind, right? And, and I want you to do this because you know I'm a big one for not taking another man's medicine, and sometimes right. I feel like because we all want to do so well, we're quick to try something that might not be applicable to us. Talk to the applications of this um, for, for, for the folks listening, because certain folks just maybe can't get their arms up nice and high, like a Nicholas or a Justin Thomas or someone like that. Yeah, there, uh, there are things um, as flexibility goes along and this um, arms and shoulder situations, perhaps when, when your uh, body's a little bit damaged over some years on the planet, mm -hmm. uh, you might not be so apt to lift your arms that very easily. And you might be muscular which sometimes allows, it doesn't allow you to do that as well. So big muscle guys typically have the arms kind of locked into the body more. So uh, it's a real connected way to swing on that lower one plane swing. And then others that have, uh, you could say they have maybe longer arms than, than their body height. Mm -hmm. And it's very uh, easy for them to get the hands and arms to look up a little bit higher. So yeah. That'd be the more practical application, I suppose. Mm, and 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 neither and neither one is incorrect. You, you see, I find folks, and and I was teaching full time on tour, and you talk about Mike and Andy, uh, the stack right. and tilt guys. You know, they were out there, and what they were sort of doing was a little, but it was sort of flying into the face of what a lot of teachers were teaching, and you almost got these camps that you were either one way or the other. But but you know anything thing that one way is not wrong the other way is not wrong as you're approaching this sort of stuff right that is totally correct and uh, a lot of amateurs out there don't know where to start there's so much information out there that the the, the guidelines of a kind of a model so to speak are helpful for some mm -hmm. even though it might not exactly fit their natural uh movements it at least gives them a guideline of like where to go with the arms and so like you're asking about the one plane and two plane, it's like, well, try and try and both see what it feels like and feel if, if something's easy to get there, that's the one you want to go with. If something yeah. is very difficult and kind of stretchy and tough, you you don't you don't want to spend much time doing that. And I love to, oh, gee, was this? I always do this with bright minds when they're on the show with me. You know, I get to talking about golf and. I find yeah. too that you know we all want to do so well that we're also quick to try something else where. You know, if you naturally swing the arms more upright, you know, you're seeing the modern day players like the Justin Thomas. When I was young, back when Moby Dick was a minnow and playing junior golf, <laughs> you know, um, you know, you were all I, we were all striving to be like Hogan for a while, and certain folks just couldn't do that, right? For argument's sakes, and then, and then before that, everyone was trying to be like Nicholas, and, and so every, there were golfers that sort of set trends a bit, and we were all trying to be like that person as opposed to be like who we were able to do under pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. Um, you know, you're, you're a long arm uh, swinging guy. You get those hands up easily like uh, Justin Thomas. And then uh, someone says, well, you should really put two gloves under your arms <laughs> and really stay connected, you know, put that, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they're down the road and they can't hit the ball and it feels hard and they must be doing it wrong. So they're going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. and there it goes. And Justin Thomas is not Justin Thomas. And John John Rahm, incidentally, too, I talked with him just a few months ago, and he said to me, he goes, when I was coming up, because he's got the club foot and everything, he yeah. goes, I found a teacher, and I didn't want to tell them what I needed to do. I need they, they had to tell me what have I got to do to fade the ball with how I swing. It's not yeah. changing my swing to fade the ball. 
you swing like this, what are you going to do to make sure you hit a fade under pressure? And I thought that was almost genius in its savvy. Yeah, that's a good, good point too. I mean, Man, you got Tony Fino, you've got these guys out there with short, fast, mm -hmm. abbreviated swings. They hit it forever. And then you guys got like a guy like Justin Thomas, who's not that he's a slight man, but he's obviously sinewy, fast, and strong, mm -hmm. who takes that thing up a chimney and drops it down and smashes it. So there's a lot of room in between those two model or kind of swing mm -hmm. styles to, to figure out who you are. Right, there certainly is. Uh, okay, we, we've gotten to know you. I've digressed, forgive me. Um, now I'm back on track here. Um, one of your mentors, there's some fantastic footage of young you and him together. He's had such a big influence on who you are as an instructor. Uh, Mac O'Grady, you know, former tour player. And you speak to just about every tour player that played in his genre and in, in his uh, era. And they all speak of him as if he was kind of like the it was like gospel at times, just his insights, everyone from Seve by Asteros, they all listened to him. So, so tee us off with just your, your 36,000 foot view of Mac. And then I'll start to drill down a little bit with you. Sure. My experience at that golf school was amazing. Uh, I was there. And uh, one thing with Mac is how attentive he is with you, the student. I mean, he is on you with you, you know, asking you twice if he doesn't quite understand what you're saying and, and that caught me as like, what a, what a, a gentleman, master instructor, you know? And so you really felt like he was connected with you mm -hmm. and uh, going through the drills and, and the things that he wanted you to do uh, was, was really cool. Um, and then of course, the thing that startled me was when he did uh, three golf swings, Nicholas Sneed and Hogan back to back to back with all their mannerisms and exact alignments and get the ball perfectly. That's when I, that's when I just said, you gotta be kidding. Me. He's like I a, a my swing, you know, he's like a his motor because he could play from both sides of the golf ball almost equally as well too. Said he trained uh, eight hours a day for a year to learn how to hit it left-handed. So he knew what it was like to be us, right. Or the amateur that, that, you know, didn't have the skills, didn't grow up playing in a sport, et cetera. So he was way outside the box with a, a lot of things that he did. And um, so the experience there with him was was uh, very enlightening and very fun. Yeah. And then his major influence, do correct me if I'm wrong, um, mm -hmm. was largely the golf machine. Am I correct in that or am I off base? No, you're you're very correct mm -hmm. with that. Uh, the golf machine, he mentions a lot in his instruction, but he doesn't really say it's, you know, the golf machine. He mentions Homer Kelly, who yeah. is uh, the author, as you know, and um, I'd say at least 85% has come out of there. Um, and then Max put his twists on things and, you know, went from really a couple different models as Mac went through his career in the 80s to 90s, where in the 80s he was super centered, like a, like a revolving door, just keeping the head and the body very centered mm -hmm. and just spun and hit it for forever swinging really fast and centrifugally yeah and then you went into more of a, a shifting pattern with a little bit of cg which are center of gravities for those out there and mm -hmm. he had the the three amigos that i call them of the center of gravity so the, the the pelvis the sternum and the head were the three center of gravities and you can stack them on top or move them slightly behind to hit different trajectories yeah and very very cool when you when you know what you're doing with those you can start to play uh, different shots in the game that you need to into the wind or over a tree or or those things so i'm i'm, I'm so i'm so glad you would describe it that way because as soon as folks talk use terms like the golf machine or center gravities and some of the 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 the, uh, the anecdotes the the words you use people sort of switch off because they think it's confusing Mm. But in a in a strange sort of a way, like you talk about just those center gravities and just, you know, aligning them in a certain way and you can flatten the trajectory out and then you tilt them some and you can hit the thing higher. Heck, Nick Felder said to me, he goes, if I had to hit it low, I got the buttons of my shirt left of the ball. If I had to hit it high, I had to get the buttons to the right of the ball. So so he was playing with that too in his own way. But but they're such simple concepts if people really understand them. And you've done a nice job of explaining it that way. And I would say this, I came up with this, uh, what I'll do with my students is I'll put, you can see me there. I yeah, I got you. Yeah. Uh, I would put bright red uh, post-its, the round ones, you know, the little dots. 
Yeah. I just put one here on my belt buckle or pelvis area, one on the sternum, one on the one on my hat. And there, and I would say, if you want to keep them stacked on top of each other, you're going to hit a low flighted ball. Mm -hmm. You align them dead on top of each other on top of the golf ball. You're going to hit a bullet. Yeah. If you want to move your lower dot forward and the, the middle dot, your sternum is slightly behind and my head slightly behind you, put the ball up, you're going to hit beautiful high shots. Mm -hmm. So just kind of understanding that is, uh, and that's to make you, uh, become kind of a shot maker, so to speak, or well, as as high as well. yeah, well, I love that too. And, and I do want to say this, and then so we're getting to some of your slash max beliefs. What you say there, whether you're playing basically you know stacked or whether you're playing tilted, ball position is awfully important. Um, so do you then believe in like one ball position for do you like the thing to float? And, and where did Max sit on that principle? Well, Mac would uh, adjust the ball position for the shot at hand. So um, I don't know if anyone out there might know the windows of trajectory. Yeah. And it's kind of, uh, you think about a three-story building, you can hit the bottom floor, the middle floor, and the upper floor. And then there's some uh, lines between that make nine windows of trajectory that you can uh, really gain some skills and kind of be that uh, golf channel skills mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing they used to do there. but. Uh, moving the ball location for the higher floor up towards your left foot for a right-hander or lead foot mm -hmm. and uh, keeping your head more in the middle. And yep. that would uh, produce a higher ball flight. And then of course, putting the ball slightly back in the middle and you leaning uh, as you're hitting the ball a little forward, like Nick Faldo would say, keep the buttons forward. You're going to hit a lower windowed shot. Mm -hmm. And um, so those Altered shots and spine and head alignments that impact were huge that Mac would talk about. Yeah. And, and and you scratching areas now and my mind is spinning. So so as you're doing that, you're doing a nice job of showing the folks who are watching on YouTube. For the folks on audio, you've heard how um Paul has described the ball position. As you move the ball position to it can affect trajectory, but it also has a large effect on the swing path and D plane elements of the thing, really. So I, I want you to talk about that now and, and how Max saw the hand path and really just the arc of the club head moving because there's some footage I've seen that you've posted where that club arced onto the target line and arced right off so beautifully. And, and it's almost like he had this thing on rails, really, how it, it, was, ne it was never out of kilter. The only, yeah. only time the, the, the arc sort of varied and cut across the line a whole bunch was when he tried to make it do so by body alignment. Yeah, he uh, he was the master of uh, his uh, swing plane, I suppose you could say. And yeah. um, I'm going to, on, on my channel, it's, it's going to be on GormanGolf.com. I'm going to have uh, things up there shortly um, to show Max stuff and uh, the alignments and how the patterns work. Now, he used uh, what you could what he deemed was the CP and CF. I know you know this, and it's really a centrifugal force, which is that centered motion I was talking about where yeah. in the golf machine, it talks about the geometry of a circle, and that's what we're swinging. We're swinging a golf club in a circle on a tilt. Yeah, yeah. So it swings this way, and it's swinging around your hands. So that's the arc of the circle. Now, that circle can be directed uh, to the right, of your target line, which is directly at you. I'm standing there pretty yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And that would be a, a draw style pattern because you'd be swinging the club away, closing the face as it rolls through and creating this curve back. Uh, Max's favorite pattern was uh, straight to a slight fade. Okay. And that's when he looked like he just came down, stayed on top of that ball, took this left shoulder, got it out of the way and just hit so down on the ball, staying on top of that golf ball. And the shaft would fly out right on the plane over here mm -hmm. and uh, hit beautiful smashing bullets. Yeah. So, talk, talk about that. I'd love to know this um, because you're referencing the club head on its arc, but the hand path is so crucial too. And you talked about how for that covered cut shot he liked to hit really that lead side, the left shoulder was turning out. Um, the, the beliefs on the, 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 the hand path, were they largely, largely just defined by, by body alignment and such in relation to the target line or, or was he actually trying to put certain amounts of force on the golf club to move it around the place? Well, the pressure points or 
turn the aft of the shaft to the back of the shaft with your right, uh, you know, index forefinger. Mm -hmm. And Mac would, uh, you know, concentric circles would mean that your hand path, as you're stating from a bird's eye view, would work in a semicircle. Yeah. And the club head would be like a NASCAR uh, coming around the corner at the same angle, yes. you know, same path. Yeah. And so, so the hand path would be working left, staying connected with your arms in front of you. And of course, the front of you is turning, moving the hand path across to the left of the target. Yeah. And then your ball would start uh, to the right of the hand path. Yeah. So, so obviously, so obviously he didn't, uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, sort of somewhat yeah. we the line, because you do have some images you want to show if we have, if, if you're so inclined, where he was like, he, he just loved face stability. He did, was not looking for that toe to be wag, wag, wiggling around the place in relation to the heel through the strike. No. And a lot of, a lot of his, uh, is kind of interesting. He'd have a closed stance. In other words, his, his feet would be aligned slightly with the right foot back, okay? Mm -hmm. But he'd still hit a CP pattern or that cut style pattern. Yeah. So uh, a lot of us out there or a lot of folks out there think anytime your your, uh, your right foot's back that you would swing to the right. Well, not necessarily because I set up that way naturally and my hips are straight down yeah. to the target line. So um Funny you say oh. it because a great one planner, Matt Kucha, does it. And heck, we've re we've talked about Ben Hogan. He had cuts from that position too. And I feel like for any golfers listening to this, and this is where I want you to build on this, any mm -hmm. golfers listening who might be less mobile, who can't make a full turn or mm -hmm. maybe some early extenders on the downswing, you drop that right foot back a little bit and you're on the way to the gold medal, don't you think? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, foot flare. Um, not much talked about there. Uh, if your feet are on the ground straight out, like a, it would be that of a, a, a weight lifter, they want your feet straight out. Well, the hips need to operate smoothly. So foot flare is important that you turn your right and left feet, uh, feet out, mm -hmm. turn your feet outside of the heels. Yeah. Uh, Mac preferred uh, a double on the lead side. So my right foot at 10 and left foot at 20. And that, uh, that would signify since you're turning 45 degrees in the backswing, but 90 on the forward swing, the double. So it's easy to remember out there, folks, if you're uh, wondering about the, the amount of foot flare, about 20 on uh, 10 on the right and uh, 20 on the, the left as a righty. Yeah, I love um, I, I so love that, folks. Imagine you're standing on skis, right? And the skis are just pointing straight in front where you're actually right. tearing the, e either foot out. And isn't it uncanny to you, Paul, how so many golfers, they get into posture, but they're just completely disconnected with where their feet are pointing. And they kind of wiggle their feet around. And there's never any purpose to how they set their feet down. But any other thing you're moving at speed, like a sprinter or a skier, if you get your, your skis crossed, you're falling over. And the same thing is going to happen in your golf swing. Yeah, yeah, so true. Like I was telling you before on my website, I'm releasing a kind of a member site there. And... It's like I tell my students, like you do as well, it's like, hey, we've got two touch points in the game. We've got our hands on the club yeah. and feet on the ground. You better know what you're doing with them. Right? Uh, yes, yeah. So when you put those feet on the ground, you've got to get some foot flare to make your hips more mobile easily. And what we're talking about is immobile people, office chair people that are working all day or just not that flexible. Uh, when you take your rear foot and fan the toe out and pull it back a little bit more, you can clear that hip in the backswing super easy. Mm -hmm. And, it, and that, what I do is I'll tell, tell my students to go pigeon toed back there and then try to turn. And I say, do it slowly because it's going to hurt. <laughs> you know, and when you pigeon toe your foot and try to make a pivot, your, your hip will lock up and you go, oh, wow, I can really feel that. And I go, yeah, that's why you want to turn the feet out. So it's a smooth rotation back. I love it. Okay. Um, I, I want to get back to Mac. Uh, we, we've talked yeah. about some of the beliefs, ball position, the trajectories that he loved to hit. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked about arc and, and hand path. Mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to face closure, um, you know, there's some, all the camps nowadays, if you turn on um, social media, all mm -hmm. promoting a very shut club face at the top. You know, I'm from the era where I like a little bit more neutral so you can hit different shots from there. What were Max's thoughts on um, holding the thing where the face should be throughout the arc? And, and yeah. what's your take on that? Yeah. 
Well, Mac preferred a, a, a grip in which you didn't have to do much to yeah. square the face up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the golfing machine, uh, the wonderful thing about the book uh, is that everything is defined. All the grip types are in there. So uh, I make a point of, you're asking the question, I'm going to make a point of, of even a, like a Matthew Fitzpatrick who won the U.S. Open, right? Strong. In America. Yeah. Yeah. His left-hand grip is turned like this. It almost is extended um, and cup here as well. And in the golfing machine, that's a 10 2 D grip. And uh, the, the right hand would fit where the, the lifeline goes right on the thumb. And it's a little little over uh, the thumb in, in this manner. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when the club face goes, when the shaft goes back, it just cocks right on plane. Yeah. There's no monkeying around. So you have someone. I'm going to get to the point, Mark, but this is important, no, no. For people. Yes. Lovely. important for people out there. You have a John Rahm Amerikawa Matsuyama. Very you have well. A left, -handed, yeah. left handed shake, a shaking hand grip. Yeah. And they have to roll the hand in the backswing to get it on plane. The 10 to D grip with a strong grip, it's called in golf, is a, a perfectly hinging grip on plane every time. And the club face, as you can see, is that. That one that is uh, perpendicular to the plane line, so to speak. Stronger. Strong grip, yeah. So there's no rolling necessary to square the face up. And that's why Mac loved that grip, because he could just pivot and hold on and just hit those beautiful, beautiful fades. So, I mean, if essentially have the face in a strong position, then you can just turn because you know that the face is there with you, as opposed to mm -hmm. the guys that have it on more on the weaker side, the more handshaking as you describe where there's going to be a certain amount of wrist work uh, and forearm work involved there to square it up through contact as a couple right. of body pervert mm -hmm. um right. i i'm uh, this sounds very generic but i need to do it um mm -hmm. you, you talk about the two touch points you got your hands on the club and your feet on the ground and if they worked mm -hmm. out you're kind of on your way a little bit um mm -hmm. Well, there's a movement nowadays, you know, because remember the whole thing, good golf begins with a good grip. And now it's been disproved to say, well, look, bad golf begins with a bad grip, but there are many ways you can hold it if you understand the matchups. Mm -hmm. You were speaking to the golfer at large over here. Would you advocate more of the stronger, the 10 2 d you describe, or more of the weaker with a lead hand turn more underneath the club? Where would you go with it? Uh, there's no doubt. All my students that are especially beginners, mm -hmm. I want them the, to turn their lead hand to the back of the hand so that I can see it clearly. So the 10 2 D grip, the turned grip on the club with the, the, the thumb to the side, right hander is going to be the thumb over a two or three o'clock feeling. Uh huh. Um, and that provides the easiest hinging. Yeah. Most players that have that, especially new golfers that have that grip straight down, they can't hinge except horizontally. And that's that's when you're just bending and arching this wrist over here mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to teach people how to get this hinge as you know that are that are new and either they get it right away or they don't but when you support this grip like i was saying it just hinges right on plane yeah. it's very simple to get that cocking upward action that is a must to keep the you know help keep the left arm straight and load the right elbow at a right angle for the, folks, for the folks listening to this in the car or your office, whatever, I'd advocate that you keep your eyes on the road. And then when you get home, go and check this out on YouTube so you can see what Paul's doing. I also want to add to this then, because, you know, you I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it a bunch where we're talking about the lead hand. So for right, he's <laughs> left hand now. But right. a lot of the golfers, they might get that hand on top, but then they go and magnify it with the bottom hand way underneath the thing and the thumb almost on the side of the club. It, it, that to me is a little dangerous because you, the club can get away from you. What do you say about that? You like the, the lead hand on top, but then that right hand, the bottom yeah. hand, butterfly at some, right? Yeah. Um, the lead hand, my left hand for a righty. Mm -hmm. And then my right hand fits more at a, a natural angle. So I've come up with this where, and like I've come up with it, our arms hang at a certain angle. Everybody yeah. does naturally. And the mine are turned into my leg more than they are facing uh, each other. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I just go, hey, Mark, what are we going to talk about today? And right now, folks out there, I'm just swinging my arms like you guys are talking to each other going, hey, what, what restaurant did you guys go to last night? You're clapping, you're letting your hands just meet. And my hand comes right to there. 
my lifeline just gets right on top of the other hand and there's my grip. So the right so at, the left hands end, are meeting it. And, you know, both hands sort of have the palms looking at the ground a little bit with the, the lead hand more down and then the right hand just fits on top there. In fact, on your Instagram, I saw this, I loved it. You talked about the Trevino secret where it was almost like the right hand fitting down on the top of the stronger left hand. That's correct. Yeah, the, the lifeline of the uh, right hand just fits right on top, side top of this uh, left thumb mm -hmm. and uh, forms almost what you would call a butterfly grip. If you just yeah. spread your fingers out, they're definitely not turned under like this. Okay, that would be my son's grip. Okay, <laughs> my son has a, a grip like this and he's a big boy. And I haven't touched it, but it's you think it's a rolling hooking grip, but all it does is uncock and he smashes that ball and uh, the, the right hand uncocks the left wrist mm -hmm. and he just stays under and pivots through and hits it straight. So match up. It's short game needs work with another grip. <laughs> yeah, I was about okay. to say, you're going to struggle to hit some short game shots for that. You uh, bet. We've talked about the face control. Okay, the center of the uh, the whole mechanism, yeah, the arc, the yeah. axis of it, if you will. You oh. talked about how Mac liked, you know, first for a while he played straight up and down and was essentially just rotating around this tilt. He was set up spine forward. Then he built some side tilts in there. Um, let's talk about the body action, starting with the upper body first, and then how mm -hmm. it's supported by the legs, what his belief structure was. Um, because whenever I've watched footage of him, it, it, it appears stack and tiltish in a way. Um, and, and there's never any too much, there's not, never that much drift side to side in his golf swing. And I'm a huge advocate of that sort of a move. Uh, of, a, of a not, a not a moving center? Or... No, no, yeah, yeah. I, look, a mo minimal moving center, should I say. I, I just, I don't like to see the upper body drift left and right too much. And if the legs give way underneath, I think that adds fuel to the fire. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go back to the golfing machine and, mm -hmm. um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a man named Lynn Blake, uh, who's a master instructor who worked with uh, Homer Kelly, uh, actually went to see him and did, did some seminars with him. Yeah. And I flew out four months ago to Atlanta and was certified by Lynn. I spent three days, 10 hours a day, him and I working on the golf machine, going through the book. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, in October, mid-October, we're going to do a golf school here in Northern California. For anybody that's out in Northern California, you want to reach out to me. There's a few spots left I haven't really advertised. So we're going to go through the golf machine and do some of the work. And incidentally, um, and incidentally, yeah. Lynn is on our list of contacts too. Oh, awesome. A few of our fans have reached out to us and said, you got to get Lynn on. We can't believe that you're in Georgia and you haven't got him on just yet. Um, yeah. so, so, so that's coming down the pike on this podcast too. So, but go ahead what you were going to say about uh, the body action and such. Yeah, so it's uh, it's listed in the book. It's like, a, you know, a stationary post, the player's head. This is in the machine of the book. Yeah. Which means, yeah, stationary post, player's head, returns the club through the ball squarely, okay? In yeah. other words, if you're moving your head, just like in uh, a ship's anchor, if the, the top is here in my head and I'm moving the anchor, it's always going to be at the bottom like a grandfather's clock. Yeah. And hit six perfectly, or like a Ferris wheel when they let off the kids at the bottom every time is perfect. But if this is moving, then it doesn't come to the same place every time. Yeah. So stationary head for especially anybody that's new uh, and learning the game is super important to to uncomplicate the the bottom of the golf swing. That's one of your drills. Your drill was the hold the head drill. And when I saw this the first time, I was hearkening back to Jack Grout and Jack Nicholas. And to me, this was a gospel. Yeah. And and back in the day when I was teaching full time, I actually had a clip with a long piece of string on and a heavy rubber ball. It was long enough that if if you were like high handle, whatever, you'd hit the ball too. If you're moving around, the ball would be swinging. And then that got poo-pooed by so many folks. They're like, well, the head rotates. I'm like, yeah, but the head doesn't rotate violently. It's just minimal movements. But you got to be around that head throughout. That's the one thing I know for certain. Yeah, like you, I think you saw me on there, my YouTube stuff uh, uh, there. And I, it's my Gandhi drill. I just hold your head like this. There you go. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and then you, you pivot. And anytime you do that, things get good. Okay. And I've mentioned, I think yesterday in one of my lessons, as a matter of fact, Mark, about Jack Grout and Nicholas, he used to hold Jack's hair. 
Yeah. He used to pull Jack's hair. And look at Jack. He still has a full head of hair. Okay. Which means that, <laughs> okay. Jack has a full head of hair. To, so, I mean, talk about the simplicity of like, you know, hey, don't move your head. Let me hold your hair. Well, I've got to say this, okay, folks, because what we feel and what's real is so wild. And me personally, I grew up coastal. Our climate is very much like Northern California, cold in winter, hot, dry in the summer, wind blows all the time. You guys don't have the wind that we did. And so into the wind, I was a leaner and I was always leaning hard on this thing. And I'd have to throw my hands a bit to catch up the, the, the face. Anyhow, suffice to say, when someone would hold my head or put a finger on my head, whatever, whenever yeah. I hit balls, I felt like I was tilted so far back. And now maybe it's 52 years of wisdom or whatever. It's finally occurred to me that what it felt like was wrong when someone was telling me to do that is honestly right. And now that I'm less mobile and I practice less and I haven't mm -hmm. perhaps matched up all that timing in my hands and stuff, it's paramount for me to keep what I feel like is the held head, which is actually more back and behind the ball through contact. Correct. Yeah. Being on, I agree, especially with irons, you know, being on top of the ball. And when I show you the Mac videos here um, that I've got uh, a little bit to show you here and more on my uh, site, mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll get to see, and, and we're going to see Mac shifting his CGs uh, a bit, Mark. Uh, to really get that explosion that Mac has uh, on his irons. I mean, he's physically a specimen as well. He trained himself yeah. running up and down the mountains of Vegas and Palm Desert, you know, and uh, did a lot of yoga. So he was uh, uh, really outside of way ahead of his time in, in that area. And then knowing knowing the, the golfing machine book inside and out. And actually, here's a funny story, guys. Uh, the neurosurgeon who was my student that got me into the Mac uh, class, uh, my ne neurologist, Archie Ramirez said, Mac reads higher level books than I do. He knows he's, you know, he knows more than I do about the neuro, uh, neurology. So, um, I'm glad. Mac well, look with these videos, you can talk, yeah. over them, I'm assuming so we can have a look because I had questions about the pivot of the shoulders, because whenever I've watched him, it looks like his shoulders just rotate underneath his chin so beautifully. And he's turning on around the head but turning on that tilted spine forward too so so why don't you switch let's let's share the screen you run the videos a little all bit right through, and we'll, yeah, we'll the that up. urge you to go to uh to youtube or to mark or go and become a member of paul's site you can get more than what we've got here um and i'll do my best to sort of add my radio voice to this and give you some description oh, all right perfect. all have at it there we are all right so first, I'm going to pull up this. This was me and Mac uh, in 2003. And Mac here is describing how to hit um, high shots with a three iron. See if I can turn this up a bit. But he's got a long iron there. And he's talking about his grip. We'll turn around and show that. Way on top there with his right hand. Shaft. Vertical shaft at the top, so not on a plane, not on the incline plane. If I turn around, I put that thing on the incline plane. If I go over here like this, here, I come here, flip it like this. So there is keeping it on plane, like laid off look in the back. Because when I go can't get it in the air. Here like this, take it this way, watch. I can go That's under right, right away. You can like go this. under. The shaft is vertical, coming here like this. That way, I'm okay. See that right hand up like that. Are you saying to, to, to you saying you're saying? If I go like this, if I go under right away like this, the shaft's going to be thrown in your legs, I'm going to hit it off over that. Right. So I've got to move around and move forward. So it looks like this, watch. That's how when I, when the sponsors got a hold of me doing an online Jack Nicklaus, I'm in here going. Jack Nicklaus taking his thing back here, the wee grip, and putting his thing going over here, shaft upright like this, just oh man. The so US ah. thing, if you could come on pausing this for yeah, Johnny Miller, and then mm -hmm. the neck goes like this. Look at the There's the grip over way over the top. I haven't changed it. Look at it, guys. Come on, look, look over here, look over here. Not changing. So okay, so this is beautiful. Let, let's let's recap for the folks that were listening. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what, to hit the high, the higher one, which is something that everyone struggles. Yeah. 
is saying he'd go, he'd weaken his bottom hand, right? So he can just go ahead and release the face a little bit. But when he got a little stronger with his bottom hand, that's when you have to tilt. That's when you have to droop your trail side to try and get the thing up in the air to open up the floor, to neutralize the face a little bit, right? That's right. Yeah. Do you get that uh, right palm way over the top of the club as mm -hmm. a right hander? Um, and then get the vertical shaft at the top, uh, like Jack Nicholas. Um, um, and therefore, uh, coming through, you could keep it on more of a Ferris wheel style plane mm -hmm. and feel like the right arm is underneath, uh, like almost palm up and release that club upward would hit that really uh, high shot. And the vertical shaft, I mean, this is uncanny to me. For the folks watching this, I'm going to highlight this and then I want your commentary, please. For the folks who aren't listening, at the top of the swing, Max arms are up. And I would almost say it's very Davis Love-esque, you know, Hogan-esque, mm -hmm. where the thumb of his left hand, his lead hand, is more under the club and the face looks quite neutral up there, huh? Definitely. Yeah, that, that toe is hanging down. Yeah. Uh, uh, very much so. And it's just the, the, the uncanny things. And, you know, in, this, in, this, in these videos that I'm going to have up on my site here shortly on the members area of this um, he's he starts hitting drivers cross-handed back, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the things that he can do and, and, uh, and describe uh, are fantastic. Uh, just to give you, um, you know, don't bottle yourself up in just one thing where you're trying to hit different shots as a, yeah. as a more experienced player, learning some have, skill. What I am noticing here too, for the folks watching, you talk about mm -hmm. the foot flare. My golly, yeah. that front foot of his is turned out. That, that's turned out in, in a big way. He's out 30 degrees and that hip can get around so quick and swivel mm. that left knee like he likes to do out of the way. And can he yeah. tell you how folks were paying attention? I'm a golf nerd this way. I mean, those those irons were just picked. I mean, he was whipping the ball off the top of the turf. There was not a whole lot of leading edge and ground colliding there with each other. That is fact. Yeah. Flat <laughs> spot right under uh yep, right under the center point. Okay, I, I, but you can you can let's flip to the next video. But what I loved seeing over there, um, the was was just how stable his spine was, even with a long iron. There was no like tilting back and forth to try and elevate shots whatsoever. That that's true, very true. Here's a bit of this video here. I know it's a little small, mm -hmm. uh, but we get enough view of it there. I think right, Mark. Yeah, you do. Well, folks, what we're seeing here is essentially, I think maybe you, Paul, or whoever, we've got a video of Mac from the front, and there's a few grids over the top of there to, sh to show levels, I'm assuming. And then you talked about your little sticky notes where you had the belt buckle, the center of the chest, and the cap, and basically showing tilts there throughout the golf swing. Am I right? That is correct. Yes. Just to demonstrate or actually show that there, that Mac at this point was, um, uh, was moving his CGs. You could see, and I made a little hand path on the forward side as well. Okay. But you'll watch Mac go back. He uh, drifts a little to the right slightly as he starts loading this golf swing. And then he gets to the top, you'll start to see a distinct upper body uh, fall to the front. Mm -hmm. and, and now he's just leaning on top of this golf ball. Get that out of there. You can see his head is actually a slight bit forward of the ball, which is a slight bit back. Yeah. And uh, the thing that when I put this grid up here, guys, is that when you want to see something amazing, you look at Mac's head in that center line right there and watch how it goes, takes an elevator straight up. Yeah, well, that's what yeah. I wanted to say. You know, if someone's trying this, th this was me. I, I did this because of the wind, but I kept going forward for too long. So I, I got the path way right, the, the angle of, of attack way down, and I was the spinniest, weakest ball into the guy wind you've ever seen. And in a number of heel shots when I missed where he, he, he sort of falls forward, if you will, but then hits his spot, and from there, he's moving up, and that's why that hand path just turns the corner so well. Yeah, exactly, and that left shoulder doesn't get dragging uh, uh, forward because his head's yeah. going up. Um, because that left shoulder is pulling back hard and fast and behind him. And that just sends the arms straight around the corner on that beautiful hand path. You can see with this extension of the arms Love it. and the, the thunder coming off this. And you, when you get to my, uh, my site, you know, the thunder coming off this, you want to put earbuds in. Really? It's impressive. So cool. Yeah. That's a beautiful yeah. image. 
Right. What's next? Oh, I'm I'm excited now, <laughs> folks. Folks, you well, got to on YouTube or go and join the whole site. Here, here's a uh, Lynn uh, in Atlanta working on the golfer's flail. You probably can't hear it very well, but he's describing the difference between a swinger and a hitter, and that's a whole uh, another conversation of working centrifugally, which is letting that flail just come right out by spinning your body. <clears throat> And then the hitter, as you'll see, he's grabbing the flail up there, and now he's thrusting with the right arm. Um, so, um, you know, most probably a good 60% of the players on the tour are hitters, extending the right arm from the shoulder Yeah. Uh, than, than the swingers uh, of the club. So it's going to pop into me and Mac in 2003. Man, you were so young and, uh, and, and, and uh, fresh there. Was wasn't, aren't I? That beautiful outfit. We're talking about pressure points in the hand. And this is kind of a funny thing that he does here. I mentioned Sam Sneed about playing the flute at the top. He's talking about the pressures of the hands, how long they're there, how hard to get a note, etc. I'm not pausing this video for just a second. I think I'm going to read it. No question. Um, this um, this video is awesome for the folks listening you would have heard mac in the background and stuff and he's talking with a young paul and talking about pressure points and the fingers on the club and i learned way back in the day um from just a wise old golfer and and he said when there's this for a right hander when there's trouble on the left hold tighter with the fingers of the left hand and looser with the fingers of the right when there's tr tight trouble on the right Hold a bit tighter with the two middle fingers on the right hand and looser with the uh, fingers on the left. And that helped sort of manage the face. You couldn't hit it left and couldn't hit it to the right, spent depending on where the trouble is. Tell us what Mac was actually saying to you about the pressure points in the fingers there. Well, he was saying that um, at the end there, he says there, there I, th I believe he said the number's 10, 10 pressure points in the hands. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's kind of like, you know, we'll get into that later. <clears throat> but, um, the, and I asked him, I said, well, it feels like uh, I could feel when I was doing these golf swings that I was releasing the, the pressure points a bit uh, through the impact to recock my hands on the forward side. And he said, definitely, it's changing in the golf swing. It's, you know, you don't just have one pressure. You can use one pressure, hitting maybe a knockdown shot uh, yeah. where you're using the hands as clamps and just doing that. But uh, when you're looking for speed, uh, you've got to let things release and, uh, and so they're they're changing a bit as you go. Goodness, but you you know what this to fit. I mean, you have you're poking my ears up. You're poking golfers ears up because so many folks they're just told to hold on and keep light pressure, and, and that is so far from the truth. And I think when people are playing well, they don't realize that there's this reaction from tightening to loosening, and throughout it's a dynamic movement. You don't just clamp the golf club in one way and then expect to have any sort of semblance of control of the thing. Good point there. Um, that, that reminds me of Lee Trevino, mm -hmm. uh, who used to say when he got trouble hooking the ball, he'd get a candy wrapper and put it on top of his left hand, his left thumb for him as a right-hander, and he would hold that lifeline of the right, uh, right on top of that candy wrapper, would never let it go. Okay. So he'd, be, he'd keep that candy wrapper hard on that, uh, on that thumb, and that would uh, not let the club face flip over. And that uh, works to this day, everybody. It really does. Well, that's kind of like what that gentleman said to me about left left hand pressure, ball won't go left, right hand pressure, will ball won't go right. Hey, I, well, that was me personally. I, I want to say this too. All of this stuff, and this is occurring to me, and I, I need your insights, please, that the learner in this instance and your le lessons, I'm sure, and folks who work with Mac, you became very self-aware and not necessarily result of shot aware. So you were very into what you, what you were up to to make the result happen as opposed to like, well, I'm just going to swing and hope where the ball goes. Because now when you're talking about finger pressure in, in the hands, goodness gracious, you completely removed from, from, from what the result of the shot is. Am I correct? Um, yeah, that would be true. I mean, your, your intentions on what you're doing 
with your hands or your pivot in these things um, are going to vary. It's uh, not so much of where the maybe the ball flight's headed, but uh, the feel of the the golf swing around your body and you know how it's moving. So, I think that's uh, very important to play uh, high level golf. No kidding. Well, any level of golf, you know, like like yeah. I think so many things happen reactively and almost uh, in an athletic sense. But when you're struggling and you've got a ball in front of you, it's almost like you can get overtaught at times and you're just trying to hit the ball as opposed to maneuver the club in a certain fashion to deliver the required shots. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing really. Uh, <laughs> I, I, how we can, uh, you know, choose to do certain things in our, in our, uh, our hands for one thing or align our feet up, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to produce more hip turn in one direction or the other, uh, which will have an effect on the club face closing or not. Um, and so most people need a little bit more foot flare on the trail foot to help them clear that hip out of the way to make good back swings, you know, uninterrupted with arms a little straighter. Yeah. That's even very important uh, for oh. people to hear that. All right. Um, let's skip to the next video and I've kept you for a long time. <laughs> where we are here i think that's all of them that's that's mm -hmm. all he's teasing us with folks well I, i'm going to allow you to hear this thunder now all i right. think this is where the audio is really good is that this the, folks that's just a video of mac from front on it just graceful and powerful I have, I'm reminded of a tip I read in a golf magazine like way back when I was a teenager. And it was uh -huh. from Julius Boris, and it said, swing easy, hit hard. And I remember, uh, you, you, can, you can switch these off now and, and yeah. show, show us yourself again. And I'm reminded then how, um, how that statement sort of kept me awake at night a little bit, Paul, because I'm like, how do you swing easy, hit hard? But when you align there like Mac, Goodness gracious, that thing sounded like a cannon shot coming off there. My God. I mean, well, when you see that head, that was the same video with the grid mm -hmm. right yeah. there. And when you see the transition halfway down and that head's going straight this way, well, the shoulders are spinning in a perfect circle, perfect yeah. circle. Mm -hmm. I mean, three inches this way, three inches this side. You know what I mean? And sometimes I'll draw that for people and go, look what's going on here with your, with your pivot. Yeah. It's, you know, moving around sensational okay that, that that stuff's great okay i've kept you for a long time um we've talked about the holding head we've talked about these are your things on your your some of your things on your instagram we've talked mm -hmm. about foot flare um i do want to talk about a drill that you were showing something and you called it the extending trail arm extension drill and it was really simple and i was like what a great way for people to start seeing those concentric circles you talked about and sort of where the hand path should go throughout the swing is you turning around a fairly stable hub. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure of the video you're speaking of. You had it. Uh, let me explain it to you. You you had sure. a client standing there, and he had basically his trail elbow by his side, and he but point made a finger like like pointing with a finger. Oh, you were rotating, and he was rotating, and you were having him turn to the target. And as he turned through, you could see how the hand path to where the finger was pointing. As a yeah, that was beautiful. All right. I know you're talking about like right here. Yeah, right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a couple of guns holstered here, right? Uh -huh. so, uh, players that make the backswing pivot, you got your finger just next to your um, side of your pocket here and the elbow just comfortably up against your, your chest and you make a turn. You're going to see your hand swivel and start to turn to the golf ball. And yeah. this is really good for good proper leg movement. I know you can't see me all the way down there, but we've we've got you good there. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And so we're going this way. And then on the forward swing, I got the hand over here, finger pointing, and now I can point it right to the target. And this is a real wonderful way to get the hips uh, rotating the knees together, facing the target, level hips, instead of somebody that might come in and slide a bit. And now it's very difficult to get this right hip to to make a move towards the target. Yeah, and that finger, okay. the folks viewing is pointing right at us. The folks listening there, instead of the finger that's now on his trailing hip, instead of it turning around and all the way around to look at the target and perhaps even left of the target for right-handers, 
the tilt has that thing looking right all the time. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm assuming even I'm I'm assuming even because you're doing it standing up fairly upright there, that if you kind of bent forward as if you were over a golf shot, it would be even more appropriate and you would sort of sense when the spine would straighten up even more, right? Yeah. Well, you're gonna see it. I think you'll see it right here. I'm bent down as I start coming through. This left hip's gonna clear, and my chest is gonna look like, well, extended back for one thing, but uh -huh. still tilt it over the ground, which is really helpful for the hand path that you're talking about. Oh, I love it. And Guess most... who's gonna go and try this stuff this afternoon, folks? That would be this guy here at the at the helm of this podcast. This has been such great stuff. I, I'm so thankful of your time for your time and your insights, and and I want to direct people to your website. So please share your uh, social media handles and what the web address is again, please. Sure, it's uh, gormangolf.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can reach me at paul at gormangolf.com with email. Mm -hmm. um, my nickname is Gormanator, by the way. I'll thank Arnold Schwarzenegger for that. <laughs> uh, so my Instagram is p gormanator. Uh -huh. If you want to catch me there and you can find me uh, on YouTube uh, under my name, Paul Gorman with my, my logo, um, my bright blue logo there, but the members site is going to be cool. Mark is, I'm going to have, you know, you know, Hogan had more than one secret. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have them all there and a, a bunch of this uh, wonderful Mac stuff with the, uh, the golf machine and the explanations and make it more palatable for the novice player as well. To yeah. follow okay uh, i don't often do this with folks but i feel like it's somewhere inside of you there and i'm going to give you the parting shot uh, uh, it's something you want to leave the listener slash viewer with paul it's yours if there's such a thing have the stage um are you talking about uh, a simple uh, just an idea yeah huh? for the golfers out there yeah okay oh. i'll leave this as a party shot if you're wondering what a swing plane is, folks, you think about the shingles of a house, okay? Uh, I knew and, you were going uh, here. <laughs> the house, what's that? I knew you were going here. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you look at an A-frame house, and the front side of that house has shingles going down, mm -hmm. and all the way down to the gutter, okay, where the rainwater goes out. Yeah. Now, your club head's in the gutter, okay? When you swing up the shingles, it's just up the incline of the shingles to the very point. And then it slides all the way back down to the gutter where the ball is. And of course, on the other side as well. Now, some of you will have upright swings. So your shingles would be more like uh, one of those Swedish homes that have a lot of snow or up in Tahoe here in Northern California. Or uh, a mellow one would be a, like a bunny slope. So you got black diamond, you got bunny slope. And you could say that the bunny slope is more suited for the driver, a yeah. little, uh, little flatter roof. And then when you get to the irons, you must, as the ball is closer, get it a little bit more on the Swedish model. So there you go. Sensational. <laughs> You're the best, man. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. A lot. Um, really fun. Folks, GormanGolf.com. If you're in Northern California, check him out. It'll be well worth your while. He's teaching. He's up early in the morning, too. Paul, <laughs> thank yeah. you so very much. I appreciate you joining us. Thanks again, Mark. And anybody that wants to join me for the Lynn Blake TGM School and Napa, California, hit me up.